Academy was leader and I was Shadow Chancellor in developing the policies for the last two manifestos and some of the more detailed work that we were doing about how we go forward in terms of yeah, regulating and developing finance, but also raising the resources to fund the various initiatives that we planned in government, in particular the Green New Deal as well. My other friend I've invited along is another professor. I mix with these sort of professors these days. There's Professor Prem Seeker. Prem is a professor of accountancy, um, was at Essex, was at Essex, and he's He's got a lot of form, basically. I've worked with him over the last 20 years or so. He was involved in the first stages of setting up the tax justice campaign. He set up a group on corporate reform, corporate abuse, how they tackle it, bring together a whole series of um, finance experts as well as lawyers. And he's been the advisor to a number of select committees and going back over the years as well. And we desperately needed someone in the House of Lords to lead on the, the financial reform regulation and tackling, well, corporate abuse within the finance sector. So we forced him to go into the laws completely against his will um, because he wants to abolish the place. So do we. But anyway, Prem is now um, in the House of Lords, um, I think, really finding his feet in terms of raising issues in a way in which actually the government has found it impossible to answer some of the issues he's raised and the policies he's advocated. The third friend I've invited along is Joe Grady. Joe um, is General Secretary of UCU, the University College Union, uh, which represents its, its academics, of course, but not just academics, it's administrators and others who work throughout the higher education sector. Joe became General Secretary in last year, no, sorry, 2019, I'm losing track of time, um, and immediately got thrown into uh, some of the biggest disputes that the sector has been involved. And I'll embarrass her by telling her, I think she's won the admiration of her own members and across the trade union movement as well. I want to bring in uh, Joe as well to talk about higher education, but also about what's happening with regard to the trade union movement more generally because she's been involved in some of the discussions about the need for well, trade union rights in this country and how, how we go forward. Okay, the idea is to have a conversation and then there'll be lots of questions I'm sure that hopefully we'll be able to respond to. Let me kick off though, but just when we advertised this event, it was advertised on the basis of a reference to Claim the Future, the initiative that we all participated in last year. Uh, let me explain the background to that. Uh, we, it was basically at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, I'd stood down as Shadow Chancellor. And we'd already, when Jeremy was leader and I still Shadow Chancellor, we'd already put forward a whole programme of policies to deal with the, the pandemic and its first wave. Policies like the furlough scheme, and also the, the scale of investment that was needed, both in terms of the NHS, but actually social care was the other big area. Some of those policies the government took up in a very half-hearted way, and the furlough scheme they took from us, but then implemented it partially to about 3 million were not covered uh, until self-employed freelancers and others, and also didn't really match the level of income that people needed, and also the level of support and sick pay and others they never took on board but at least we made some some um, interventions that had to be addressed but after that um one of the things i th i thought it was because there were so many references but in various speeches particularly from boris johnson about the second world war where he was trying to wrap himself in the So actually, in the Second World War, it was some nevertheless progressives and socialists came together to dream and to discuss and to plan the society that they wanted after the war was over. And I thought, actually, the period in the pandemic, when it was pretty, well, it still is, but it was pretty grim, that actually what was needed was for us to come together and to talk about the immediate issues that how we confronted the pandemic, of course, but also to talk about the sort of society that we wanted to create after the pandemic. And it was after 11 years of austerity, 
and then the COVID pandemic hitting our society. So what we did, um, we, we called it Claim the Future because I was getting annoyed about that slogan, Build Back Better, being used. Uh, I, I didn't want to go back, I, you know, certainly Build Better, I certainly didn't want to go back. So there's someone came up with the idea of what we should be doing is claiming the future now for a progressive, core, a progressive cause. So what we did is we brought together a large number of policy experts and academics and others um, with campaigners, different campaigning bodies and different think tanks to talk about some of the key issues that people were concerned about, to put forward ideas about where we go from here and what improvements could be made, what sort of society we want to create, what sort of policy program is needed, but more importantly, how that could link up with campaigning on the ground because it's all well and good discussing ideas, but actually what you need to be doing is really campaigning for them and then testing those ideas in practice. So it was that concept of praxis, you know, theory and practice put together. And what happened was we had whole dozens of panels of people thinking through ideas, discussing it, bringing campaigners together. We published a whole series of policy papers, linked up with a large number of campaigns, published an overall pamphlet towards the end of last year. It's all on the Claim the Future website if you want to have a look. But the idea was to try and create a climate of opinion about the need for progressive change and transform to change for the future. It's informed a number of the debates that have taken place. Um, and we're hoping it can feed into now the, the Labour Party's policy review that Keir Starmer has now launched. Um, I'll shut up in a minute, but if you look, if you go on the website, you'll see that the basic premise is that there is the potential of a real paradigm change taking place. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, after this, just go back to the Second World War. After the Second World War, there was a huge paradigm change, a change of attitude. And people look back on the 1930s and said, never again should we ever go through that economic and human suffering that took place and that we need to create a different type of society. And it was based upon social solidarity. It was based upon planning your economy, publicly owning uh, sections of your, of your economy and building a, a welfare state in which everyone had a basic level of needs satisfied by the state. Thatcher came along in the 70s, changed the paradigm. It then became individualism, no such thing as community, privatization, private wealth, undermining of the role of the state itself. Well, we've had 40 years of that, and the, it was an injury called monetarism, then eventually neoliberalism. We've had 40 years of that, and to be honest, it's significantly failed, hasn't it? Uh, after 11 years of austerity, we've got grotesque levels of poverty and inequality. Public services, when the pandemic came, were so underfunded, you know, 100,000 vacancies in the NHS, the same in social care, that it's only been on the basis of the absolute commitment, dedication and sacrifice those those NHS workers and other carers as well that we've come through it so far. All of that led to, I think, a recognition that the, the current system is actually bankrupt ideologically in terms of ideas, but also in the way it can manage society. And we're now faced with this huge existential threat of climate change and so the existing paradigm isn't capable of dealing with those challenges so what seems to be emerging as a result of austerity and the pandemic is basically uh, an understanding first of all that actually we care for each other as a society there is such a thing as community we need each other uh, we need to work together to in yes yeah, social solidarity to tackle these problems that actually there is a role for the state and the state of bringing people together to be able to tackle these problems that you can't deal with individually. And at the same time, there's a general view as well that everyone, everyone that does have a right to a decent quality of life, a roof over their heads, an income, care when they need it, treatment and a decent education as well. All of those issues seem to be emerging in the debates that are taking place across society. So that is basically the premises upon which we've been working together that there's the potential now of a huge paradigm change, that we can create a new society and a new world. And you know, also, it isn't just our activities or our conscience ends at the channel. This is about the global change that are needed as well, particularly, as I say, as we face this existential threat of climate change. So that's where we got to. 
But one of the key issues in all of this is, first of all, how do we deal with our current economy when it is so dominated by finance and that financial sector, to be frank, I think has served us badly and also has some inherent defects of, well, actually levels of corruption, money laundering, but also wasteful the waste of resources that we have. So that's why we, we were relying upon Daniela and Prem and the work that they've been doing over the years really to inform the debate from here on in. So this is where I, I, I shut up, I've spoken for enough really. I wanna throw it to you, Daniela now. Okay, just, could you just explain your view about how the finance sector now operates and what needs to be done? Um, by the way, Daniela's uh, joined us from Transylvania where she's visited <laughs> Paris. It's really good to see you. Daniela, yeah. over to you. Thank you, John, and good evening, everybody. It's a couple of hours later here, but um, I'm very glad to be sort of participating in this conversation. Although, as I was listening to John, I got a little bit worried that I might be striking a more pessimistic tone than the one he has been uh, sort of putting forward. Uh, so let me say, maybe I start from a pessimistic point of view, but maybe uh, just to identify sort of strategic uh, political entry points for, for what is awaiting for us, because so I'm a, I'm a macroeconomist and I'm very interested in paradigm changes. And I think for a good while last year, we were we macroeconomists were, were sort of excited by the possibility. I mean, we were excited while uh, John was a shadow chancellor that we might see the possibility for a fundamental paradigm change that would bring the state back in some very clever ways. And, and I have to uh, sort of reminisce uh, and, and congratulate John on the work that he has done in order to put some serious foundation blocks and some, some really material views towards how that uh, rebirth of the state would look like. Um, and last year with the pandemic, I think a lot, a lot of uh, macroeconomists thought that uh, what we had is sort of 30 to 40 years of, of wisdom of, on, on macroeconomics, that you need a small state, that fiscal policy has to be uh, um, as, as ineffective as possible in some ways, and the, the responsibility has to be put on the central bank. That, that's, that sense of, a, <clears throat> of, a, of an orthodoxy seemed to be going away. However, uh, I'm a bit more skeptical now, and maybe I'm more skeptical because we have a conservative power in government, although there are some interesting things happening mm -hmm. in the US, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, sort of focus on my remarks on the UK and maybe in the question and answer session, we have a bit more time to reflect on the, on the way in which the, the shift in the US might be driving the UK macroeconomics uh, in a sort of different direction than the conservative government would want uh, to take us. And let me say, I want to say two broad things where I see two strategic fronts on macroeconomics. I, I see a threat of austerity coming back very significantly over the next uh, couple of years and connected to that, uh, the shape of the low carbon transition will be very much a big finance driven carbon transition. So in a sense, this concern about how private finance is very powerful. Well, uh, for, for private finance, this crisis has turned out to be what Naomi Klein called a uh, sort of crisis or disaster capitalism. It's an opportunity to reassert their, their power and an accumulation regime that will be based increasingly on turning the climate crisis into a profit opportunity with a, a backing from the state. So very briefly on the macroeconomics and the return to austerity, uh, what we have seen over the past year, it's a very large fiscal effort to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. John has explained, I think, very well why there were very important questions of distribution there and having a conservative government in, in power uh, made, us, made those questions of, of distribution not entirely uh, progressive. But what we have now is a macro picture of a very rapid increase in public debt to GDP ratios. Uh, and this, I think, will offer the conservative government a very useful narrative to push for massive fiscal ret retrenchment over the next year or for austerity and to further to push further an ideological agenda of shrinking the provision of public goods and of privatization, either through the front door or through the back door. And uh, I'm, ha I'm glad that uh, my, my uh, union representative is here, Joe Grady, because I'm in academia, but we already heard a very worrying news that the government is preparing significant cuts to higher education. And my, uh, my suspicion is that the big prize besides uh, cut, cuts to local authorities 
is to further push for private provision in the in the national health system in the NHS. And I think we should, uh, and maybe we have time to talk about this. We should be prepared to fight the battle against fiscal fundamentalists because I think the conservative government continues to be fiscal fundamentalists in the sense of of wanting a smaller state, wanting to to shrink the capacity of the state to respond to crises or to to create structural change uh, through a kind of green new deal. Um, uh, approach, we can be prepared in this fight with a in this fight with a very simple message that the, our government is not a household. It has a central bank, the Bank of you England. It, down, please, John. it has the Bank of England by its side, and uh, we know that the Bank of England can do a lot. It has bought almost all debt issued by the uh, UK government in 2020, and uh, it lowered and it maintained its borrowing costs low. So uh, it can deal with the macroeconomics of the, of the pandemic. And I think our argument is that it can, the Bank of England can and should continue to coordinate closely with the government, particularly when it comes to the low carbon transition. I, and I think this is a very important point. If your starting point is austerity and is fiscal retrenchment, you cannot do the imaginative kind of Green New Deal policies that, that John was outlining when he was a, a shadow chancellor. And this is where private finance is coming in. And, and, and it's not only the UK, but I think there is a global consensus emerging with some, some variations in the US there is a global consensus that uh, um, if we have to think about the low carbon transition and how to finance investment in green infrastructure or, or in, in green industries, the government cannot do it. It, it should just escort or accompany private finance and, and provide subsidies and incentives for it to do so. And in a couple of words, what we know, and I think this is very fascinating for the, for, for the politics of, of, the, of the moment where we are now, what we know is that the UK is hosting COP26 this year. The Conservative government surprised everybody. And I think they, are, they have a very clever strategy to take John's policies and, and sort of uh, paint them over very conservative uh, actual policies. But they have given Bank of England an environmental mandate, which is something that we suggested to John it should do. And there was some worry at the time that this would affect Bank of England's independence. But the conservative government just came out and said, well, you have to take care of the climate and, and, and go for it. And I think uh, this um, it, it's very tempting to think that, uh, and, and I think the Conservative government will say it over and over again, that the UK is a world leader in decarbonization, right? But here, I think it's a very dangerous narrative because the devil is in the macroeconomic detail of what this means in practice. And in practice, uh, I think we, we can think of two alternatives to organize the low carbon transition. One is a big green state or a new green deal kind of program that invests in green infrastructure and in green industries that re regulates dirty finance, because this is something that we know very well and it's been discussed e exhaustively in the world of, of private finance, that there, are, there is lending to high carbon activities, there is lending to fossil fuel companies, and this continuous credit creation that allows companies to continue to pollute is contributing to the climate crisis. So if you come from from this Green New Deal, big state kind of approach, what you have to do in order to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy is you have to properly regulate private finance to say, we will penalize you if you continue to, to lend to the shells and the totals and the BPs of this world. And we will penalize you by making it much more expensive for you to lend to them. And, and uh, private finance has been fighting against this. And I think it found a very good ally in the, in the uh, British government uh, at the moment by saying, well, uh, instead of regulating us, what, we, what you should do is to put us in the driving seat. So what we think of shadow banks or, or global asset managers that manage actually our own money, our, um, my, my pension fund that manages the money of insurance companies uh, in the UK, these asset managers are now in the driving seat and they are in charge of identifying what are green activities and what are brown uh, dirty activities. And you know, the incentive is there very clear. You want to make everything look green. In other words, you want to engage in massive greenwashing. And I think this is a world that we should be going back. If we want to talk private finance now at this particular political juncture, the word greenwashing is fundamental to my mind because this is what we are seeing over the past two or three years. We are seeing a massive global greenwashing exercise that is being conducted by private finance on its own terms under the guise of we want to turn green and we can turn green with a, a bit of help from governments. So what we are looking at for the next 
I would say two to three to, to five years is a massive program program of government of, of government and state subsidies for private finance to continue greenwashing, which is not going to take us into a very rapid rapid decarbonization, but it's going to going to basically do what has happened over the last past 40 years, which is a massive redistribution of resources from uh, citizens from the state towards private finance and towards the 1%. And I'll, I'll stop here and then I'm happy to come back to how do we fight this? Thanks, Daniel. Before I move on to Prem, just to let people know, it's worth looking at what happened in Parliament yesterday around this very area, because the um, the Tories have been quite clever in the way that they presented their last budget, which is about increases in corporation tax, which actually this, the argument was, well, they're implementing John McDonald's budget. No, they're not. Actually, I doubt those increases will ever take place before the next election. That's the first thing. But the second thing, last night in the finance bill, £25 billion pounds worth of tax reliefs, in other words, tax giveaways, were agreed. Uh, and interesting, almost unconditional. So again, it's a way, it's a way of almost laundering taxpayers' money into the hands of large corporations. And there's no, there was no distinction on which corporations. Actually, it looks as though quite a lot of that, those tax reliefs will go to places or companies and corporations like Amazon. It were, so they'll never pay any tax whatsoever in this country at this rate. It was quite staggering. But again, the argument, exactly as Daniela said, the argument is put forward is, well, these tax reliefs will suddenly in, in elicit investment from the private sector, which will go towards tackling, you know, green infrastructure, etc. Unconditional giveaways, it was. What was interesting, though, I have to say, Daniel, in the debate last night, they've now admitted for the first time, I've sat there year after year, and they've nauseatingly argued that cutting corporation taxes would grow the economy and create jobs. At least last night, they admitted they were wrong on that one for the last 10 to 15 years. But then they simply shifted from giving away money in corporation tax cuts to give them away in tax reliefs. The irony was not lost on a number of us. Prem, let me come to you now. Prem's been involved in some of the, well, exposing the corporate scandals of the last 20 years as a result of lack of regulation in the finance sector and beyond, including the what the role of the big company, auditors, etc., and what they've done in terms of tax, well, tax avoidance and in some instances tax evasion. Prem, what sort of reforms do you want to see now? Well, first of all, well, thank you, John, and thank you to Joe and everybody involved with this particular seminar. And uh, hello and good evening to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, let me perhaps uh, begin with the comments uh, you made earlier about the role of the state. Uh, what the neoliberals have done is actually not roll back the state, as they like to claim, what they have done is restructured it so that it has become a guarantor of corporate profits. And good examples of that are, for example, through PFI, through quantitative easing, you know, have pushed up the house prices and made them beyond everybody's reach while speculators are doing very well. They've done uh, uh, bank rescues. They have uh, given, as John just mentioned, huge tax concessions to corporations. So the role of the state is absolutely vital here. And I think that needs to be changed. And obviously very difficult to change that unless a left-leaning party is in power. And that is a prerequisite in some ways. Now, Daniela earlier referred to how we might be heading to another form of austerity. Well, actually, austerity never really left many people and, and many people hardly actually gained. So even if you look at the post-banking crash statistics, in, 2000, in March 2008, the average wage in the UK was £473 a week. In February 2020, just before the pandemic uh, deepened, it was £474. And remember, that is the average, which includes... Uh, things like payments to uh, Premier League footballers, corporate executives and so on, which you can't easily strip away if we were able to do that 
that means the plight of the average family has really become worse. And that is then captured by the tax statistics. So if you look at the poorest 10% of the households, given that there is an income squeeze, but your council tax is going up, VAT is at 20%, and you can't uh, forego some form of consumption. So the poorest 10% of the households are paying around 47.6% of their income in direct and indirect taxes, mm -hmm. compared to 33.5% by the richest 10%. And that, in a sense, gives you a clue that how you know people uh, people are suffering really. So clearly, the tax policies need to be fundamentally rechanged. But all around us, we are surrounded by re regressive tax policies. For example, look at value-added tax or VAT at the rate of twenty percent hurts the poorest the most inevitably. Look at uh, national insurance contributions, 12% up to the income of 50,000, thereafter 2%. Uh, that's not really progressive. That means the rich people pay even a smaller proportion of their income into the na international insurance contributions. Look at income tax, 20%, 40%, 45%. Well, of course, uh, the 50% rate was abolished. But then look, every now and again, the government boasts that how it has increased personal allowances. Now, if you are a 45% tax rate payer, a hundred pound increase in personal allowance is worth 45 pound to you. If you're a 40% taxpayer, it is worth 40 pound to you. If you're a 20% taxpayer, it is 20%. And there are 18.4 million individuals in the UK with income of less than £12,500 a year. It is worth zero to them, absolutely nothing. So not really surprising that the gap and the burden of tax, as it were, is, is widening. And uh, then you look at things like pension, uh, tax relief on pension contributions. So about £40 billion is roughly given. More than half of that ends up in the pockets of the 10% top earners because they get a bigger tax relief. Very little goes to the basic rate. There are, despite their low income, 1.5 million individuals contribute to private pension schemes. That means they get zero tax relief because their income is less than 12,500 a year. So all our tax policies are rigged against uh, ordinary people. And if you, then, then you look, if you are rich enough, you might own a second home, you might uh, possess some stocks and shares, you might have artworks. When you sell them, you make capital gains. Then there is a capital gains tax regime, well, which, which taxes capital gains at a much lower rate, between 10% and 28%, compared to earned income between 20% and 45%. So once again, it favors the rich. And John earlier mentioned the loss of tax relief for corporations. Uh, there are hundreds of tax reliefs for which the governments, I must say successive governments, have been unable to provide any rationale, any document to show how those tax reliefs contribute to any kind of economic benefit. Today we saw reported in the FT a piece of research which said that last year the government gave 7.5 billion in research and development credit. But amazingly, the corporate spend on R&D has actually declined. So you can see a lot of accountants at play turning whatever they can in order to uh, uh, get R&D tax, tax credits for their clients. And uh, so, so lots of things are wrong that need to be addressed. We need to make people aware of the tax injustice. And a lot of people are simply not aware of a lot of things. So the result of all this, you can see what an unequal society we become. And if I give you some pre-COVID figures, because COVID has obviously distorted the stats, in 2019, just six richest people in the UK had as much wealth as 13 million people. Or the 100 richest had as much as 18 million and the richest 10% of the households own 44% of all the wealth, 
and the poorest 50% just own 9%. So the, the, the consequences of all that can be seen in our high street. What do the poorest people do? They spend money on everyday things, food, shoes, clothes, maybe some of the bus fare. Now, when they can't spend, <laughs> that does not stimulate the local economy. If the rich person buys artworks, good luck to them. It does not, stim it does not create many jobs. It does not stimulate the economy. If they, if they buy a yacht, yes, the yacht builders uh, gain something, uh, uh, their workers earn something. But beyond that, there is very little contribution to the day-to-day -day local economy. So the Keynesian lessons about the multiplier effect and stimulating demand have been completely lost and forgotten, and they again need to be uh, looked at. So we have over 14.5 million households living in poverty, which includes 8.1 million who live in working families, but even work does not get you out of poverty. And 4.5 million children live in poverty, and that is simply unacceptable. But John earlier referred to Thatcherism, so let's look at what Thatcherism did. Thatcherism talked about flexible labor practices, well, that's another story, but essentially meant weakening workers' rights, weakening trade unions, not allowing them to undertake collective, uh, free collective bargaining. You can have secondary production, it can be shifted, but you can't have secondary picketing. So the net result of that is what? In 1976, the workers' share of GDP in the UK was 65.1%. It is now, just before COVID, around 49.5%. That is the biggest decline in the workers' share of GDP in any industrialized country. Of course, people on low wages can't really afford to buy a house. So the conservatives tell us that they have increased their pensioners' uh, benefits. So certainly there has been a triple lock on pensions, but the net result of that is what? That the uh, average, the, the, the that result of that is that the state pension is about 29% of average earnings. Put it roughly, that is half of the minimum wage. Now, it seems crazy to me that we have a minimum wage and the state pension is less than the minimum wage. Those 18.4 million individuals with income of less than 12,500, there is no way they can put away for a decent pension in retirement. Insecurity and early death awaits them. We need to align the state pension with the minimum wage. We need to check the flow of wealth upwards. And the good thing in the last Labour manifesto, and John and colleagues called it high pay levy, I sometimes call it inequality tax. There's a very simple uh, way of operating is, which is to say, look, as taxpayers, we must not subsidize inequitable distribution of income. So what? So the proposal from my perspective is effectively to say, we will limit in the corporate tax computation, the amount they can claim for executive pay. So no executive for tax purposes can have more than 300,000 pound. So if a company pays them 100 million and 300,000 pound, well, they will only get tax relief for 300,000, other 100 million would be taxable. So inequalities are a form of social pollution. They deprive people of certain kind of life and living rights. So the principle, which is well accepted by everybody, is that we must penalize the polluters. So those who are creating social pollution must also be uh, penalized. We need to put workers on company boards. Without that, there is no chance of anybody uh, ensuring that businesses work for everybody's interests. At the moment, many of them are simply playthings for uh, 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 an, a corporate elite. Just quickly to talk a little bit about the world of finance. John mentioned the finance industry is corrupt, and it is thoroughly corrupt. UK has had a banking crisis in every decade since the 1970s. In the 1970s, we had a secondary banking crash. Insurance companies collapsed on the back of that. 
property companies collapsed, the then Labour government had to arrange a loan with the IMF, though it never used it, and the Conservatives always twist that. In the 1980s, we had Johnson Matthey. In the 1990s, we had BCCI and Bearings. Then came the big banking crash. Today, we read about the Wylands Bank, well, which uh, is now under investigation for possible fraud. Shadow banking is still un utterly unregulated, uh, and we are here talking about trillions of pounds, and the early sign of problem in there is with the collapse of green cell. So we need a regulation which works for the people, not for the industry, just because industry just does not really want proper regulation. We have seen banking frauds, whether it's HBOS frauds, RBS frauds, banks forging people's signatures. We have seen mis-selling of numerous products, financial products. We have seen interest rate rigging. We have seen a, a rigging of foreign exchange rates. No investigation. Nothing seems to happen to these people. So in the Labour Manifesto, there was a proposal for an independent public inquiry. That is definitely needed. Without that, you will never get to these executives to admit what they are doing. They need to be examined on oath appropriate documents need to be uh, produced. We need to democratize regulators. So I did a project for John, which John mentioned earlier. I went around talking to some regulators and asked, what is your objective? And the standard reply was, we serve the public interest. Then I asked, where is the public on your governing structures? Oh, oh dear, that was a terrible question to ask. So we need public on governing structures and the regulatory bodies to watch over those executives and to ensure that what they actually do. We need to shrink the finance industry. Now, don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is we all need bank accounts. We use insurances. We have credit cards, debit cards. We buy foreign currency for our travel. What we don't need is unrestricted speculation and frauds. So a large amount of the finance industry does not really produce anything. One study from colleagues at the University of Sheffield showed that between 1995 and 2015, the finance industry made a negative net contribution, not positive, negative, of 4,500 billion pounds to the UK economy. That is roughly two and a half years GDP that completely vanished because of what the finance industry has done to us. That I have referred in parliament a number of times to ministers, invited them to comment, no comment. Instead, they quote me figures which are produced by the finance industry and which are false. Maybe in questions I can explain a bit more uh, later on. So, so we need a smaller finance industry. It is killing off everything else. In the high street, look at what's happened. Bird and Matthew was owned by private equity. They're basically asset stripped. Debenhams, another victim of private equity. Maplin, another victim of private equity. HMV, another victim of private equity. The list is actually endless. So these asset strippers come in they put very little money into those companies in, to, uh, in, uh, in the shape of share capital. They actually give secured loans, which means they become secured creditors. Then they deliberately put their companies into liquidation. They basically only sell the assets. They jettison all the liability, including the monies owed to pension schemes. And that is wrong. We need to deal with that. So maybe in questions I can clar clarify a bit more, but basically the finance industry is running amok. It must be brought under democratic control. I'll pause there, John, and we'll get Thanks, Prem. a bit more. Thanks. Thanks, Prem. Daniela mentioned before the, the new wave of austerity that's happening already, but is coming with a vengeance, many of us think. And Danielle mentioned one of the areas where they see the maximum opportunity of both in terms of austerity cuts, but also in terms of profiteering through privatization and the role of casualization as well as in higher education. Joe, your, your union's waging, well, from what I see from the disputes that are taking place at the moment, virtually a daily battle to protect jobs. But also what's interesting in 
Well, I've done very Zoom picket lines. I know Liverpool are out at the moment, for example, as well. There's a dispute there. But on all the picket lines that I've been doing with regards to the UCU, it's also about the, just the protection of education as a, as a service, as a sort of a gift to the next generation. And it's amazing just how many, um, but how many of your members really feel not emotionally committed, not just because of their jobs, but because they want to be able to provide a decent standard of education in the future for these many of these youngsters. And that's what is under threat. It isn't just the jobs, it's the core service itself, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I, a few things, I think it is worth pointing out that a lot of branches are in dispute at the minute. Um, many of them are in dispute about redundancies, um, but some are in dispute about other issues as well. But um, the ones that are about redundancy, so to, to use Liverpool, the example that you've just picked, I actually think it's um, a good example of the themes that have run throughout um, both Daniela and Prim's, uh, Prem's um, contributions, because essentially what you have in higher education is almost a bit of a zombie market, really. You know, the, the, the government have increased fees in the hope that they kind of can defibrillate HE into a genuine marketplace. And it hasn't happened because you had all institutions adopted the same fee regime. Um, so they've had to enact all manner of um, metrics and measurements. So you have something called the Research Excellence Framework, which is a huge, very costly, expensive census that happens at you know, certain time periods. You have the National Student Survey. So you have all of these league tables that supposedly measure value or excellence in some way. And in some ways, they really don't need to exist because they're there to satisfy a customer of a relationship that the government is, you know, is intensely trying to enact. What these are then being transformed into are performance management mechanisms. So ways in which you can slice and dice your workforce to say you can stay and you can go, but it is essentially creating uh, an inherently unstable, volatile labour market um, and the end result is to ensure that nobody ever feels safe. You know, so even if you um, go through the run and you get that elusive full time permanent contract, um, you still never quite know within any ref period. So going back to that kind of census state, when might be your time to, to be performance managed out? And obviously, the reason I'm sort of telling this from a staff perspective is that steals your time. It steals your time, it steals your morale, it steals the energy and effort that ideally and staff that work in, in higher education, and particularly those that teach, would prefer to be spending with students. So I'm 37. When I joined academia, I was a young lecturer. I was 25. I had loads of time to spend with my students compared to when I was elected two years ago. When I was a student, my staff had even more time to spend with me. So this zombie market system that the government is in intent on creating because they want to use it as a way to withdraw their own funding to try and create the market that hasn't fallen into place. The shock absorbers of that are staff whose working lives are made increasingly miserable. Uh, that comes through on all of the picket lines. People absolutely fed up um, with universities being turned into something that they are not. And students who, you know, in this last year had to pay the very highest cost because they were lured back to campus, despite the fact we all knew it was unsafe, despite the fact that, you know, UC had taken a very strong uh, public position. And in some really unfortunate circumstances, some students paid with their lives, you know, not just their health. And that was the only answer that this government had, because poor funding of that sector, deliberate poor funding of that sector, um, as I say, it meant that students were dragged back um, with disastrous consequences. Now, for me, um, there's a broader challenge to us all, because I'm not going to sort of repeat, I think, what Prem and Daniela did, which is, you know, really map out the problems. And they did a great job, and I don't think you need me to do that. What I think is our biggest challenge is how we translate all of that and make it something that people can understand and rally behind. Because I think, you know, if we go back to um, that post-war Keynes beverage, you know, moving into the post-war period, um, 
it, it wasn't a, a given, I think, that Churchill would have been defeated, you know, a kind of a glory, whatever we might think about Churchill, you know, a glorious war leader took the country to victory, got absolutely pounded. You know, there was um, an alternative, not from Labour, it has to be said, from a Liberal peer um, and, and a Liberal economist that really put forward a set of coherent arguments about the future we want. You know, the Beveridge Report, um, I studied it, uh, have a lovely first uh, copy of it. It's not full of the problems of the past. It's not full. It, I mean, it has obviously um, critiques, you know, it talks about the the, the, the wants uh, and the things that we should cure, the ills. Um, but it's very much a blueprint for where we want to be. And it's a costed blueprint. Um, it's a really sensible one, because obviously that was sort of Beveridge's uh, thing. And it ended up taking on a bit of a life of its own. And I think that that's the real challenge for us now. Um, how do we take the challenges and the things we don't like and turn them into a vision of the future? Um, because, you know, the Tories and the right wing in general are really good at governing us through fear uh, and of making us think about what we want to protect and who we want to keep out. Um, and I think our challenge is more than just critique. It's about how we reach out to people and get them to understand that this is the way forward and that that might be different things to different groups, but that it's progressive in general. Um, and I say that because in UCU, that is what we're trying to do. Um, you know, if you think about something like university governance, it's a bit of a boring campaign. Who wants to be on a campaign about university governance? Do you know what I mean? It's like, what does that mean? Whereas if you explain, well, actually it could mean a future where your workload is not dominated by all these ridiculous metrics because actually you elect people who run the university. You know, we don't get these managers. So you, you map out a blueprint of what that means. Um, and I hope that that's what part of this project is really, John, um, that we are trying to crystallize what a future without these problems would look like um, and really try and get people behind them at UCU at the minute, just this evening before this call, we've got 400 of our activists. We had 400 more uh, back last year going through an organizing school. Jane McAleve is running it. It's got 9,000 people around the globe that are on it. The whole point about this organizing is you are seeking to organize the entire worker. You are not just saying these are your industrial issues and this is why you should care. It is about saying what is the benefit to the community if we do these things? And I really believe that the only way we are gonna shift the mindset of people who maybe don't think the things that we're discussing this evening are their problem or that they have a role in solving them is, um, and, and you know, we all, we all don't necessarily do this because we like talking to who we like talking to is actually organizing in our communities beyond that. Um, but then I think the challenge for, you know, politicians, John and the Labour Party in general is to seize on the moments when they happen. You know, so if we're gonna talk about industrial issues that can be bigger than just industrial issues. Let's think about the nurses. Um, we know from polling that actually big parts uh, the, of the general public were really behind a big uh, pay increase for nurses. You know, the, the kind of the moment of the contribution that had been made, the sacrifices that nurses never offered, but that were kind of demanded of them, particularly through, um, you know, neglect, non-delivery of PPE and what have you. The government, sorry, the, the public were there, I think. The, the polling showed public opinion was there. But there wasn't anybody saying, there wasn't anybody there with that beverage plan. There wasn't anybody there with that let's go in this direction. So I think that there's a big challenge across the left of how we formulate what we think are the answers, how we articulate what that looks like, but how we actually reach out to various communities who maybe don't trust us who are maybe fed up, uh, who might have good reason to be, who need convincing. And for me, therefore, part of this vision is um, not pandering to sometimes I think the knee jerk reaction, you can't out Tory the Tories, <laughs> you know, that isn't, that, that, that isn't our aspiration. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with this anymore, but what, I, what I'm trying to get at essentially is that I think there are lots of people who have lots of energy to give but I think that there is sometimes a bit of a missing link in what we're doing. And we've got lots of people in trade unions in this country. We've got lots of people in um, you know, civil society groups. 
And I think we need to kind of try and unlock how we bring those people together. You know, if we think about Marcus Rashford, outpouring when he announced, um, you know, that he was getting behind challenging the government, lots of people clearly wanting to be involved, but now we don't have an architecture and a structure of how those people can stay involved. And I think that that is something that obviously and we could, you know, I could spend all night listing it. The Tories have deliberately dismantled those communities, right? It's not an accident, but it's going to have to be reestablished. You know, when we're, we're not going to get lucky and just win an election and change things. We are going to have to rebuild. And there are no shortcuts to that, essentially. So I will pass back to you um, and, and allow us to carry on. Thanks, Joe. That was great. Thanks a lot. You've focused our minds a bit on terms of where we go from here. And it is, um, it, it is um, basically, you're right. It's trying to link the issues that people are worried about to campaigns and the reforms that we need. There's been a whole series of questions that have come in. One of them, let me just throw this at all of you, really, because it comes up at virtually every meeting I do now. Um, I'll read it. This is from Joy. Many Labour MPs talk about aiming for 100% employment as if everyone could be employed. And even if they could, yeah. there's no guaranteed income for workers. We do not need work to live. We need a guaranteed income, whether disabled, caring for a family member or wanting to work in lower paid community works. So what's your view on universal basic income? This issue comes up every meeting I do virtually. Now in the Claim the Future discussions last year, we were talking about a, a, a guaranteed minimum income rather than at least as a first step towards a, a, a UBI of some sort. Danielle, what do you think of UBI? Uh, thank you, John. I feel a bit now chastised by Joe into into not coming with a critique instead and, and try to paint a positive <laughs> picture, which is kind of difficult because I am I am not very convinced by the UBI proposals in the sense that my 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 biggest worry about UBI came when I realized that uh, Silicon Valley uh, tech entrepreneurs <laughs> were supporting and pushing UBI, and I, I always worry when I find myself on the same. Uh, side of the barricade with with very very rich billionaires and I think this is one of the concerns that we we need to bear in mind that uh, a lot of the calls for UBIs seem to um, come from uh, parts of the political spectrum that uh, view this as an alternative to a public pro provision of or state provision of public goods to a proper uh, uh, welfare system, to a proper safety net. And of course, I, I don't believe in a, in a society, although I have to say I, I, I was born and grew up for a, a chunk of my life under a system that called itself socialist, where that had a centrally planned economy where everybody was uh, um, given a job uh, and sometimes expected to work. Um, but I don't believe that everybody needs to work. And I believe as a macroeconomist that the state has resources to support those who do not, who cannot work for a variety of reasons. And we do not need a universal basic income to do that. Unless universal basic income is accompanied by policies that make sure that the power of trade unions, for example, is not weakened, that universal basic income is not spent on private commodified uh, health education, uh, uh, and all sorts of public, what we used to think of public goods. So that that's my my my. I don't know. I will try. I would I would try to paint a, a more positive uh, sort of view. Uh, but I would say uh, the the big struggle is there to bear in mind that the questions of the, uh, redistribution are critical. And if we do, if we ignore questions of power and of politics and and big finance, so I saw there were a couple of uh, uh, issues there. Focusing narrowly on UBI is a very convenient solution for the the the, the people or for the, the the system that we have in place that concentrates wealth very massively. We, I feel like I need to step in. Come in, Joe, come in. Come. It was certainly not to berate anyone. If anything, <laughs> um, I actually, you know, as as a former academic, academic. Um, there is a place for people who do critique. That is kind of the point. I, I'm more berating myself and I think, you know, people in John's shoes and, and people who are 
elected actually to try and energize change that I think sometimes people, you know, I've done a lot of online events recently and I've, I've even found myself sitting and thinking, why are we all just here moaning? Like who, who, we, who here is mapping out the blueprint? And that, that falls on people like, not, not necessarily you, Daniela, so it wasn't a brain. Um, I, I think not to get all theoretical and academic about it myself, but if I have an issue with UBI, is um, not, not the idea of it per se, but actually I, I have a real bee in my bonnet about how we think about the economy and that there's a real kind of fetishization of a formal contribution to the economy, the formal economy, i.e. traditionally blokes in jobs earning money. And I think it's a really kind of patriarchal obsession with uh, what it means to contribute. And um, like I say, I sort of don't want to sort of over intellectualize this, but I think if you kind of go back to Marx, the whole contribution of value of other people's labor that maybe does prop up the formal economy, but is something else altogether, I think ends up being quite erased and also ends up being seen as secondary to anything you do to the economy. And I think the idea of somehow trying to fix it for people who can't contribute, I find it a little bit patronizing to be quite honest. And I think if we're trying to move away and actually reconceptualize the way in which people give value in different ways, I think almost giving people the idea of a pass out by saying have this money instead because you can or you don't need to doesn't quite work for me. So um, I'm not opposed to the idea that we contribute in different ways and that, you know, if we're to have a, a kind of a civil society where people can contribute, that we look at the idea of some form of um, income to allow people to do that. But I kind of have problems with the way in which the debates are framed quite often. Well, Reinhardt has come into the um, chat or Q&A and has said this is a, we have a neoliberal version of UBI and an emancipatory version of UBI. An emancipatory version of UBI is combined with universal basic services. Well, actually, in the last manifesto and in the Claim the Future discussions, we moved towards a minimum income guarantee, but that was alongside a clear commitment of universal basic services. And it was combined and you might think this is a cop out, the pair of you, but we also said, well, let's have a few pilots of UBI as well. Now, what's interesting is that, I mean, Mark Drayford in, in Wales, it looks as though they're going to see if they can undertake some UBI pilots and the same as in Scotland, although it's quite difficult if you're not in complete control of the welfare system itself. And so I think there's a real, my view, I'd, I'd like to move towards a situation where people have a basic level of income which gives them a decent quality of life. It's as simple as that. And how people achieve that either through work or through other forms of activity within society is, is a matter of for debate. But I think it's key. And I I didn't I was just doing some more research on again what's happening back in my own constituency. I'm at the level now of 42% of the children in my constituency are officially now living in poverty. Now, we've never had that in, I've lived here 40 odd years, not longer, 45 years now, and we're a high employment area with, and the wages actually now, uh, the point that Prem made, wages now have been forced down so dramatically that they nowhere, go nowhere near to meeting the housing costs, for example, of, of just keeping a decent roof over your head. And so we're now, we're in a startling situation where we need to do something very fundamental to lift people out of that poverty as well. I, I'm, I'm up for a minimum income guarantee as soon as we get back into government. It has to be linked to trade union rights. And don't underestimate the threat to trade union rights that's coming under this government as well, particularly from the police and crime bill and how that will impact, impact upon picket lines, etc. But I also think it's right that we need to ensure that there are, we, we define those universal basic services. And under the Claim the Future project, we did expand universal basic services to include a whole range of things. My favorite, of course, was free universal broadband, which was condemned. Can you remember when the week that came out, the BBC ran a slogan all the way along the commentary of broadband communism. Now everyone wants it. <laughs> And the Tories have stole the rhetoric, but 
not the substance, this classic stuff, isn't it, Fred? This is the point that you made, Daniela, early on. Let me just go to um, one of the questions on the financial system that came in. Let me just find it again. Um, again, it was from Peter Kahn, I think it is, Peter. He said, uh, don't you agree that for the last many decades, the left stroke progressives have concentrated too much on the role of income redistribution as a way of achieving a fair society and not taking the role, whether you're bound to agree with this, not taking the role of finance and the massive concentrations of wealth and power that have emerged. And he's saying, I'm, I'm talking here of wealth taxation, reforming abolishing the stock market, encouraging state finance and regulation of private finance, generally increasing the power to intervene with the central bank while reducing the influence of commercial banks and financial middlemen. Over to you, Prem, on that one. Sorry, let me, I am uh, unmuted here. Well, yes, uh, I have a considerable uh, sympathy with that, and that's why I was saying we really have too much finance, and it is really a curse. It's holding back the development of other sectors, and almost every day the government throws some concession at the finance industry. Uh, last month we discussed the Financial Services Bill in the Lords, and government introduced uh, parts of the bill which are completely contrary to what they're telling people. So, for example, the Chancellor tells people we want to tax companies uh, where they make their profits. But the bill had a provision, uh, it has now become an act, under which companies from Gibraltar can sell any financial services in the UK. So what that means is uh, the customers in the UK, the transactions in the UK, the sale in the UK, profits are made in the UK, but they will be booked in Gibraltar. So Gibraltar does not levy any corporation tax on profits not made uh, in, uh, on, on, on the rock. So governments uh, deliberately providing all kind of tax dodging opportunities uh, to companies. They did the same with gambling. More than half of the gambling servers uh, for online gambling in the UK are based in Gibraltar. And again, this profit is basically siphoned off. So, so I think you know governments need to join up the dots. But on our part, I think we need to use almost anything we can think of to redistribute income wealth. And that's why, in a sense, it's important also to democratize corporations. So government recently published a consultation paper. It talks about building trust in auditing and corporate governance. And it starts off with a completely false assertion. It said, uh, if I quote more or less the words exactly, shareholders are owners of companies. There is nothing in Companies Act which says shareholders are owners. There is no economic theory. There is no legal theory which says shareholders are owners of companies. Companies have a separate legal identity. There is a huge case law uh, for, throughout the 20th century on company law which says directors are not agents of shareholders. Otherwise, shareholders could step in and say, by the way, how about buying this asset? How about selling that asset? Can I walk in and, uh, you know, it's my company, I can walk out with the table and chair because I'm the owner. Uh, none of that applies. So the government itself is promoting myths. And on the left, we have to engage with those things. But I think we do have form of wealth taxes, for example, capital gains, inheritance tax. But capital gains tax, as I said earlier, is even lower than uh, the tax on earned income. So it doesn't really affect the distribution. Inheritance tax is so easily avoidable by those who should be paying. So we don't really have proper wealth taxes. We certainly need them. And I earlier referred to an inequality tax or a high pay levy. And uh, we need to broaden the tax base and, and really, all of that could be used to fund what John said earlier and others said, a universal basic income. We have the resources. We can do it. We can give people dignity. But the most painful thing is that there are people in full-time jobs who are not earning enough to support their family. That is the real injustice. That is absolutely wrong. And the governments, you know, 
don't really tackle this. And I have cited the statistics I mentioned earlier many times in Parliament, hoping to coax a minister to reply. They do not reply, they do not engage with those statistics. So I think, you know, it is, we are really dealing with a kind of a balloon which has so many lumps. And sometimes you press one lump and it appears somewhere else. So we really need multiple policies to deal with the multiple aspects of our social problems and connect them. Because otherwise, one by one, it is very difficult to deal with the, the, the problems which are really deepening. Danielle, you were doing work with us on the National Investment Bank mm. and also the role of a central bank under Labour. Do you want to just respond to Peter Kahn's points of, about mm. that? Because it's absolutely key. Before you do, before, otherwise I'll forget it. In the finance bill last night, they froze the lower threshold, the personal allowance. So that actually means the very lowest paid are now going to get a tax increase. Uh, uh, just extraordinary yeah. while they were at the same time shelling out money to the corporations. It just, but my problem is I'm getting increasingly angry with this lot. I'll just have to behave, I suppose. Daniela, just on the role of the central yeah. bank and state yeah. financing. I just want to start by noting that we ended up talking about income distribution <laughs> instead of, of finance. So That's probably right. Peter Kahn uh, is feeling uh, quite vindicated in his point. Uh, and I would say something maybe just as a, as a slight provocation to John, because this is something that I also I'm, I'm wondering about. And it is that I, I think uh, the four, last 40 years of neoliberalism that started with Margaret Thatcher and, you know, Milton Friedman and Margaret Thatcher putting his, her hand on the printing press and saying that's the end. No government can go to the central bank and, and get money and, and stuff like that. I think what it has done two important things. The very obvious one is that people get bored with talking about macro, although I think it's very important, but you know, trying to keep people's attention to talk about fiscal and monetary issues, it, it's difficult, it's a challenge. I, I, I face it every day. And the second challenge there, and I think it's much more structural, is that a lot of the power of finance uh, is so hardwired in, in our daily lives that it's very difficult for politicians, even from very progressive sides, like uh, our esteemed uh, chair here, to take on it. Because for example, I've been doing research for the past three months. I've been depressing myself by reading about the role of the way in which uh, the housing market is becoming increasingly financialized. In other words, houses are becoming increasingly owned by investors like private equity companies who rent them out, buy them, rent them out at very expensive rents, right? And if you look who is behind these private equity funds is my pension fund. Uh, who is contributing to this private equity fund because it needs returns. So if we want a call to action from politicians, to my mind, one of the most powerful ones would be to say, we need to nationalize pension funds. Now, wh which politician in a high income country is prepared to say, we need to nationalize pension funds because the way in which they are structured now is basically they just provide our money to private equity companies who redistribute profits and at the same time financialize every public good that I can think of. Now, that is a very difficult political message to send because it says you need to hardwire the entire, uh, rewire the entire financial system and shrink it in order to get the kind of a happy ending of the income redistribution that we think of on a daily basis and talk on a daily basis. But I don't know how, how one fights that battle politically on the pension fund front. I mean, the UCU in our trade union has been fighting that because of the massive, massive cuts and, and, and um, changes. And maybe mm -hmm. Joe wants to comment on this. But to my mind, this is the most important problem that we face at the moment, that our financial system is very powerful because it's been designed in a way very cleverly. We have to give it to the conservatives and the neoliberals, they are clever people. Uh, that is without doubt. Joe, but you, Joe, in your dispute, you mobilized really effectively. So yeah. you did translate quite a complex issue into a, a narrative that mobilized your members on a, you know, I was on those picket lines, I went down at Goldsmiths and elsewhere and people knew what the issue was, and it did weld people together. Yeah, um, and we're, we're actually, I, you know, um, we're going to end up in a d dispute over pensions again. Um, I'll come back to what you've just said, but I just want to pick up on what Danielle is saying, because, you know, our pension scheme, so in HE at the minute, there's two pension schemes, but the one that we've been in dispute about the most is USS, it's the University Superannuation Scheme. And everything Daniela is saying is true about that scheme, but you can see it about others. And 
um, it is complicated to explain to people, but it also isn't. And I think that, um, as you're saying, the, the, the membership, I think, of UCU have obviously really paid attention to what's happening with the scheme and have explained it to each other. But I think our campaigning on the issue have also really underpinned just how needless the attacks on the scheme are, how the regulation, you know, and, and I think this is kind of, <laughs> I don't want to sort of make this personal, but my entire PhD was about how new labor really helped um, DB scheme, defined benefit schemes become DC schemes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try and step back from that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> don't do, are you right? Don't do. <laughs> There was a real kind of collaboration, uh, whether intentionally or not, with the idea that this is the only way things can be. And I think if we look at the Royal Mail scheme and the privatization of Royal Mail and the slide from a defined benefit scheme into this co collective defined contribution scheme that they've got, working people okay. and their trade unions really do need, um, I mean, we, we can make the case on our own, and I think you see we've done a good job of it, but we we're always on the back foot, I think, if there is just an acceptance at the top that your scheme is in deficit. Well, no, our scheme isn't in deficit. Our scheme appears to be in deficit because of the way in which uh, regulation is set up that we basically have to be ready to mothball the scheme at any one moment and therefore don't really have great ways that we measure it. Um, you know, so there's, I could go through it all, but it'd probably be a bit too long and conv convoluted. But what we have done in UCU is really explain to people and outline to them, the scheme is solid, the HE sector in the UK is going nowhere. We will never have to mothball the scheme in 10 years time. This is justice. This is your deferred wage. You know, your, and, and I think this is a really important point. When people target your pension scheme, that's because there is nothing left for employers to extract value from anymore. You know, where possible, they've created zero hour contracts. They have suppressed wages. So when they are coming to devalue your pension, it's because you are the last site of profit extraction. And if we stand and let them do that, we are basically saying we're going to forfeit part of our retirement, our future well-being, because our employer must squeeze that extra bit now. And that's the way we've got to really talk to people about it, not oh, well, the deficit's there, we, we've got to plug it. No, we don't. You could never throw enough money down a deficit that's created by bullshit, you know, uh, accountancy uh, regulation, and you can. And I think that's the way you've got to really talk to people because whether you're, you know, a librarian in UCU or whether you're a postman in CWU, people understand that. And I think it's, you know, having the ability to convey, you know, convey these messages to people is fundamentally an important part of politics. Um, you know, people are not stupid, people care, people are engaged, but often they are patronised or they are um, actually just kind of, you know, not best represented, I think, by the people who we trust to represent us. And I think a lot of the time, the people in unions have ambition to protect themselves. But unfortunately, people who are actually in more of an influential position to speak up I think they've lost any ambition that they can change things and they're thinking about winning next elections and they're thinking about all of those issues um but you know in ucu just to take it back to our union before i hand it back to you they came for our scheme in 2018 to change it from a defined benefit pension to a defined contribution and we held them back we had a strike last year which um, i think held the line we are probably going to be in a dispute again later this year, if not next year. But we are the only union this far in the UK that has ever defended an outright attack to take a pension scheme from defined benefit to defined contribution. And I don't know where we're going to end up in six months time, but that is huge. And that is why there is attempts to do it a bit more slicing and dicing this time. Um, but it's a huge thing to protect. And it's, it, it's crucial that we keep pushing because we're not just doing it for UCU and for HE staff. It's a much bigger thing to defend. I fully agree. When the last coordinated campaign by trade unions to defend pensions, which was largely led by the motivation of PCS from Mark Sawatka, unfortunately, the unions broke apart and it was really unfortunate. And I think it was because of that failure, really, in some unions to be able to mobilise their members around a very straightforward message and they got conned, absolutely conned. And also, there wasn't a political alternative, I don't think, being provided at the time. And I agree with you, Daniela. The one, one political alternative is actually 
public democratic control the pension funds themselves um, but I, I try and use every meeting I do now to make sure that the role of the discussions is always to try and demystify elements of policy and exactly as Joe said translate that into messages and narrative that we get across it's always more difficult when we're dealing with economics because economics the edu economic education within our movement has not been particularly particularly effective in recent years and I think that's one of the roles that that we have to play but it does come down to concrete examples I want to go to the we've only got a few minutes left but I want to go to one question that Dinah Ward put up and it's proved to be the most popular in the list where people have done a thumbs up to it and it's very it's very pra pra practical actually she said look we've already seen a very successful example of global greenwashing in the form of the hydrogen economy and this project proposed and promoted and driven by the fossil fuel companies intends to continue extracting and using fossil fuels at the same rate but by converting them to hydrogen pretends that they're now green unfortunately regional government and this is true has fallen prey to the greenwash we now have large amounts of public money being handed out under build back better and leveling up agendas for regional projects that will lock fossil fuels in place in several regions how can we build opposition to these policies that are promoted so cleverly i think it is actually the bit of an exposure but offering alternatives as well who wants to come in on that i know you may not be hydrogen experts um, but actually it is it's quite interesting how government along with the private sector who, who make fortunes out of this the next wave of the fossil fuel industries if you like in the different guys the work that they're, they're doing on the ground particularly with mayors and others to try and promote these projects and they are using it as an argument for in areas where they're arguing that they'll level up what's the alternative prem do you want to comment yeah just a brief uh, comment firstly i think we all have to do what diner's done that is to ask questions about it make people aware of what is happening build alliances with journalists they have a very important role to play we need complete transparency about uh, uh, what the governments are doing and wh where, how they are giving money away and for what purpose. Where is the impact analysis? Often these days, there is very little public, very little transparency about how the government is funding a private sector. Again, can use tax policies to, uh, if you like, check some of these things so that if there is investment in fossil fuel, for example, you don't give any capital allowances. You know, there are lots of harmful activities which are not supported by government, not supported by taxpayers. So this is a, another example. This is really an existential threat to the whole of humanity, what the fossil fuels are doing. So it can simply be to say, okay, you can invest in plant and machinery, whatever you do, but sorry, it will not get any uh, uh, tax allowances. It will need, obviously, a bit of fine-tuning. But the other important thing I think what Dinah's raising is, I think we need to kind of rebuild people's common sense. We need to rebuild human identities so that, if you like, we have a revolution of human consciousness. People are able to think critically rather than simply just being, being pushed along by politicians and journalists and even retired academics. Uh, you know, in a sense, look at what the conservatives have done. Now, they have created slogans which kind of reposition people, reposition their common sense. Slogans like build back better, leveling up on the surface of it. Yeah, everybody will say, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, of course, if you scratch the surface, you find something else, which means you do a, do a critique. But uh, uh, I think underneath it, there are all kinds of other issues, but nevertheless, I think we need to rebuild people's common sense, rebuild keep people's identities. Again, I'm a great fan of her late Stuart Hall's book, Hard Road to Renewal, and I recommend that to everybody to read and rethink how we can use Gramsci and maybe even Foucault and others to rebuild people's common sense, popularize some discourses, and build opposition to others, really. So I just stop there. For the many, not the few, actually. Summed uh, absolutely. Up. That was a great slogan. But, it has, but you know, Labour has 
the current Labour leadership hasn't made much of that and hasn't really come up with anything of its own either. That, that's the shame. That's our job to persuade them. Daniel, we've got the last couple of minutes and I always... Meetings, I'm useless at chairing because that meeting's always overrun because I get carried away. Um, but we've got a few minutes left. Final comments, Daniela. Uh, thank you. Just to agree with Joe that uh, uh, my comments about uh, the difficulties of, 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 of engaging people on, on sort of macro and finance issues were more, more sort of directed at politicians rather than regular people uh, having, having gone to the House of Lords to give expert advice. Uh, yeah, it was it was a challenge. So I think that's well, that that's where we need to start. I'm, I'm I'm very clear. People in the street understand very quickly, especially if they have somebody as as persuasive as as Joe to to do the job of of translation. I would just say that I think Dina's question is very important because it it also touches on something that 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 has to do with the political message, which is that that our progressive messages can be very easily co-opted and and transformed by mm -hmm. by powerful corporate and financial interests. And uh, the, the whole agenda of greenwashing basically is an agenda of, of portraying something that is uh, dirty as, as green. And I can give you numerous examples that have to do with what I think is it's the dangers of net zero. And I think the powerful message that we need to come up with is, I don't want to see a fossil fuel company existing in 30 years time from now or in 20 years time from now, this is, they can't, there is no way that they can compensate for their activities because what they usually do is they use the compensation scheme as a way to actually further climate change and, and worsen the climate crisis. So again, going back to the state needs to take responsibility. This is a public good. You cannot rely on the private sector, whether it's finance or corporations to drive the low carbon transition because they will just game it. That's it. It's, it's yeah. just a game. Joe, final comments. Thanks, Daniel. That was excellent. Thank you very much. I think it goes back to sort of, I sound like a broken record, but I think if if we want um, people to care about issues, we have to start from a position of trying to understand why they're not already engaged mm -hmm. um, and trying to actually transform, you know, so if we're talking about pollution or if we're talking about any, any issues, like what does that mean to a community? You know, because most people, you know, if we use the family unit as an example, most people want something better for their kids, right? They don't want people growing up like um, it, with polluted environments. Um, and I think that figuring out what people care about and campaigning around that and building community activism around that and linking in with other groups. When I'm saying as a union, we need to organize the whole worker, you know, so, in some American teaching unions, you know, they've not just reduced class sizes, but they've done it in terms of getting like nurses into schools, you know, to actually say, what is the school for? What do we use these places for? Wow. So for me, it's always about opening up an issue and why people care about it, um, rather than trying to figure out why you don't care about my thing um, and making it understandable. Because I do, you know, I agree with Daniela and Prim, P Prem, people do care about macro issues and they do think in that way but also people have really complicated ways of thinking and they don't. And I think sometimes it's our, you know, responsibility to connect those dots. Um, and I know you're wanting to finish quickly, but I think connecting those dots sometimes is about getting people to take a step back. Mm. So in the UK at the minute, a really good example is, I always mess this up, but the police crime sentencing and courts bill, completely unnecessary piece of legislation. If we see that alongside the attacks on academic freedom in universities, mm -hmm. if we see that alongside the attempt to introduce voter ID in general elections, this oh. is a government that is not comfortable or confident with its worldview and is looking to suppress dissent wherever it can. Um, and in that sense, you know, whether it's about this issue, that issue or the other, there's got to be a way that when we're organising with people, we are making it, making it clear that this is part of a broader pattern it's not just one thing um and that's really complicated and it takes guts as well i think because um it's not easy to stand up against things that as, as people on this panel have already said this government tries to present as rational and normal and needed um but yeah so i'm probably gonna end there but thanks no it's a great it's a great piece to end on because I'm launching this history pro podcast at the moment. We're going through the history of class struggle of the last 800 years. And it's quite interesting, the police and crime bill, just how much 
that is an assault on some very basic fundamental rights. Mm. And I actually I spoke at a UCU fringe event where I was trying to say, we need to wake up to just how ex extreme this government is when it comes to these issues. And the good thing about it, though, which I find eternally optimistic at the moment, is just there's a new generation coming forward. Well, you're part of it, Joe, so are you, Daniel. And the new generation that's come forward now that are taking these issues on in a way which is quite sophisticated, well, in terms of the argument, but also in the creative mobilizations of all of this as well. Prem, Daniela, Joe, thank you very much. And can I thank the festival organizers for inviting us? I hope people have found this uh, of interest and, and uh, certainly in terms of the questions and others that have come in in the discussion, I found it um, really helpful. It helps you focus your minds as well. Um, and there's been a lot in the chat about this festival. It, it needs funding and the only way to do that is through the donations. Please help. Um, the final question was, could I play this um, session out with my trombone? You do not want to hear me playing the trombone at the moment. Oh, Give me oh. another at least <laughs> six to 12 months. Yeah, we do. <laughs> and if we have a session next year like this, I'll have a practice on the red flag on the trombone. Okay. Thanks ever so much, everyone. I hope you found it worthwhile. Bye then. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Oh. Thanks. Oh, I don't think.